Okay, this, this morning's Torah portion is what? That uh, is, what does it say up there? That's exactly right. And what does that mean? It means, and he went out. There's another word I want to introduce that is so important in these verses, and it is the word paga. And that means when he went out, what did he do? He came to. And you're going to see he didn't come to any place. He came to a certain place. Whenever you see that in the Torah, that means this place is something special. It's not just any old place. It is a certain place. Now, in, we're going to begin with the end of last week's Torah portion, Genesis 28, 1 through 5. Here we see Isaac calling Jacob. He blesses him. He charged him. And he said, don't take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. And so our verse now begins with Genesis 28, 10, 11. Jacob, what did he do? He went out from Beersheba, okay, and he went toward Haran, and he lighted or came to a certain place. And he tarried there all night because the sun was set. I want to stop there for a minute. It's interesting, as he's leaving the promised land, the sun is setting. And in the next Torah portion, when he's coming back in, the sun is rising. Okay, so he's going into darkness. It's a time of darkness as he's leaving the promised land, and then he comes to a certain place. Where was that certain place? Anybody know? The Temple Mount. He came to the Temple Mount, that area. And then it says, he took of the stones and put them for his pillows. And he laid down in that place to sleep. And so we find Jacob's descent from the land of promise is a descent into darkness. And Jacob's exile, he's gone for 20 some years, is symbolic of spiritual darkness. Now, that word Paga means an encounter, an encounter, but it is a divine encounter. He's going to have a divine encounter at that place. Now, he put a stone for a pillow. Which size stone do you think he used for the pillow? <laughs> All right. Uh, I, I don't know if he used some big monster stone. And I, I, you know what? I am going to show you the very area of that place in just a little bit. Here we go. One of the things I also want to do is go back to the timeline, and I believe we have the timeline charts over there on the table. If you already have one, you can even pull it out uh, from last week. But I want to show you the time period of where we are. We are... Clear down here, Isaac is 137. He just blessed Jacob and Esau, who were 77 years old at the time. Now, of course, Isaac lives another 43 years, but he thinks he's going to die. And we know that as Jacob is leaving and going into exile, he's headed to Laban, and he's going to work for seven years which means he's 84 years old when he's done working for Leah and then adds Rachel. Okay, now, it says about this certain place. And it's the place, the place was, there's a word for the place, ha makom. Makom means place. But here is the Hebrew word for Makom, which means the place, but within that word, <clears throat> we see the word kum, which means to rise up. Jerusalem is where the Lord was going to rise up from the dead. Now, watch this. Here we go. Here is the phrase. It says, and Jacob rose up early in the morning, and he took 
the stone that he had put for his pillows and set it up for a pillar and he poured oil upon its top. Here is in Hebrew, ha Evan. do you see that with the black and red? ha Evan. ha is the, Evan is the word stone. Now go to the top, you can see right there with the black and the red, ha, the letter H, and then Evan, which is the Aleph Beit Noon. But this isn't just any stone. Uh, it's, there's Evan, I put on the big rock, Aleph Beit Noon. But it's the Aleph Tav. Now we know Aleph Tav uh, basically in a Hebrew is a, a direct marker, but I think it's interesting that we also know the Aleph Tav as the Father, right? So it's not just any stone, it's the Aleph Tav stone. But what's fascinating to me, if you look at Psalm 118.22, there's the stone which the builders refuse is become the headstone of the corner. Well, guess what? You see the word Evan for stone, it's made of the Aleph Beit, which is what word? Aleph, the Aleph Beit is what word in Av, which is daddy. Okay, Abba is daddy, Av is father. But you use that middle letter again, you get the word Ben. And so here we have the father and the son and the stone that the builders rejected is the one stone made up of the father and the son. The very word stone means the father and the son who've come together. Now here's a picture of the temple mount You'll see in black, this is the Al-Aqsa Mosque. And what is that gold place called? The Dome of the... Why? Because inside is the very rock that Abraham sacrificed Isaac on was about to. This is the rock where Jacob's father Isaac was almost killed by his grandpa Abraham. This is called the foundation stone of creation, where God created everything. Isn't that fascinating? I don't know how many of you have you know, ever been to Israel or to the Temple Mount. Now, so what's interesting, uh, Jacob, he erects a pillar and he pours oil on it, and the name of the site is called Bethel, which means what? Bait is house, El, God. It's called the house of God. Do you know this is the first anointing in the Torah? The first anointing in the Torah is anointing the stone. Okay, and the Hebrew word for Messiah is Mashiach, or anointing. Now, this is an anointing that comes from heaven. Now, just as Jacob slept upon a stone, God revealed the same place, there's this ladder that goes to heaven, and what do we see? Sleep often represents death in the Bible. It's like Jacob is going to sleep. And the latter represents the Messiah with his death and resurrection being symbolic of Messiah's descent and ascent into heaven. And then what do we see here at this very place? This is where the Lord appears to Jacob for the very first time. This is the very first time, and he's like 70 uh, some years, 78 or so years old. Well, here we go. Here we are. These stars in heaven and this miraculous ladder up to heaven. We see in Genesis 28, verse 12 and 13 on your notes, he dreamed. And behold, while he's dreaming, a ladder was set up on the earth and the top of it reached where? Heaven. And then it says, behold, the angels of God were ascending first and then descending on it okay well then it says and behold the lord the yude bafe stood above it well here's the problem there is no it in the torah this is masculine and it should be read the angels of god were ascending and descending upon him and behold the lord stood above him and so we see here is what he sees is the Lord above him, but the, and these angels, here comes the angels, dun, 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 and all these angels sort of coming, and they're uh, ascending and descending, and it's, it's quite amazing when we see all of this going on. 
what do they think is going on here? Oops, before I go there. Some people <clears throat> were saying that it was shift change. And so the angels that were protecting him in the promised land were leaving and the angels that were going to protect him in exile were coming. Kind of fascinating. <clears throat> and um, even the sages disagreed saying the angels were upon him thinking that the hymn was Jacob, but no, the Lord was standing above him. Now, here's what's fascinating. It, it says here, oh, coming up, that it was like heaven's gate. All right, he says, this is the gate of God. This is the gate of heaven. Well, what's fascinating, it is this weekend's Torah portion where the gate of heaven or the heavenly gate is mentioned and Israel just released from heaven's gate operation was the name of the operation when they were swapping the prisoners. And it happened on Shabbat because yesterday was Shabbat in Israel. And so the very Torah portion this weekend talks about heaven's gate. Jacob sees it and they're calling the release of the hostages heaven's gate. Isn't that amazing how God works? Okay. <clears throat> Now, here we're talking about ascending and descending. Look at Proverbs 30, verse 4. Who ascended up into heaven and descended? This whole thing is to be a puzzle. We're supposed to be asking ourselves. Now, thinking this is in Solomon's time, 3,000 years ago, and he's asking a question, who's ascended up into heaven? Well, my first response would be uh, Enoch, right? Enoch, he ascended into heaven. But then it says, and he also descended. Well, no, wait a minute. Who's descended from heaven? And uh, I think it's interesting in the thing, too, it talks about the angels of God were ascending first and then descending. And here in Proverbs 30, it also mentions ascending first and descending. And then it says, who gathered the wind in his fist? Who bound the waters in his garment? Who established all the ends of the earth? Okay, well, then we'd be thinking, well, that would have to be God, right? Wouldn't you think in Proverbs, well, the Lord is the one who established the heavens and the earth, but shoot, I didn't know he ever ascended or descended. And then it says, what is his name? And then what is his son's name, if you know? Wow, this is a riddle, a riddle, and we're supposed to be thinking about it. Well, what did the Jews call the name of God? Hashem, which means what? Ha is the, Shem is the, the name. All right. Well, here is Proverbs 30 that I put in a matrix. And the verse starts with the mem. And of course, it goes, flows this way. And then it ends with the letter tav. And what's fascinating in this matrix where it says add not to his words i'll make it a little brighter for you here it says add not to his words and then where it says what is his son's name that is right there the vav is end ma is what shem is name and here you see ben which is son and his son so here is the phrase what is his son's name and what is amazing his name is ha shem and what is his son's name yeshua right there in the matrix itself we have his name and his son's name and right above it is the word ruach which is the spirit so here just like the spirit of god descending upon the son of man all in this matrix of that verse we see his name and his son's name and the spirit. As a matter of fact, look at John 3, 13. It says, no man has ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven and even the son of man, which is in heaven. Now, I want to bring up something here as well. Okay, let me see. In a little bit okay 
Look at Isaiah 33, 22. The Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. He will save us. And that's the yud Vafe. That's why the Lord is all capitalized. Well, look at John 1, 49 through 51. Nathaniel says to him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. And in answer, Jesus said to him, you have faith because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opening and God's angels going up and coming down on the son of man. This goes right back to this verse. It's the son of man who is the ladder that the angels were ascending and descending upon. As a matter of fact, look at Daniel 7, 13. Look what he says. I saw in the night visions and behold, there came with the clouds of heaven one like unto a son of man. And he came even to the ancient of days and he was brought near be for him okay so look at this what is that word in white at the top who can tell me what that word is okay what letter is this the letter yod hey vav hey it's a yod hey vav hey it's the lord now every letter in hebrew is also a number and the letter yod is 10 the hey is five the vav is six the hey is five which totals 26 so everyone knows the Yudhe Vafe has a mathematical value of 26. We also know, and that refers to the Lord, we also know the Aleph Tav, which means the first and the last. Well, here's what's fascinating. You have two hands there, right? You can almost place the Aleph Tav right there. It's like the hand of man reaching up to God The hand of God coming down to man, and the only way they connect is through the vav, which means the connector, which is the ladder on heaven and earth. Yeshua is the aleph. So two yutes is a 10, the vav is six, and again, you have 26. And so the aleph represents God, Elohim, Adonai, but you can make the aleph when you break it down to two hands and uh, the vav or the connector, that also is 26. So what's amazing, right here, you have the yud, like I said, the ancient yud was a hand, the vav is the connector, connecting heaven to earth, and right here you have the son of man represented by the ladder on the cross. As a matter of fact, in the ancient Hebrew, the yud is hand and the vav, the nail, And the two letters, hey's, look like that, like a person going, hey, (laughs) okay, behold. So God's very name is the hand being revealed and the nail being revealed. That's the yud hey And I can't help but think of, uh, let's go back to Genesis 28, 15. It says, behold, I am with you. I will keep you in all places where you go, and I will bring you again into this land. For, and I think what's interesting, this weekend, where here it says, I will bring you again into this land, and the hostages were brought back into the land. Isn't that amazing? Okay, it says, um, okay, for I will not leave you until I have done that which I have spoken to you of. So when Jacob or Israel left, he was promised that it was promised that he would also return. Now here in Genesis 28, 17 through 19, it says he was afraid. And he said, how dreadful is this place? This is none other but the house of God. And this is the what? That is right here it is in the Torah portion. And that's what they called the release of the hostage operation. So Jacob rose up early in the morning. He took the stone that he had put for his pillow, set it up for a pillar, poured oil on the top of it, and he called the name of that place Bethel. Now, some people think that this happened in the city of Bethel in Israel. Well, just because there's a city of Bethel doesn't mean that was the place or the house of God. How many know there are several Bethlehems in the United States? 
That does not make it the Bethlehem of the Bible. Okay. Now, look at Isaiah 48, 12. And again, this is amazing. God is speaking, the yud heh vav and he says, Hearken to me, O Jacob, and Israel, my called. I am he. You see that? He goes, I am he. I am the first, I am also the last. Yea, my hand is the hand that laid the foundations of the earth and my right hand is spread out the heavens and when I call out to them, they go, yes, sir. And what's fascinating to me, when Yeshua was in the garden and being betrayed by Judas, they asked him if he was Yeshua and he said, I am he. And boom, they all fell to the ground. The same words, the very same words. Now, we're in Isaiah 48, 12, and he says, I am he, I am the first, I am the last. Who can that be but the yud heh vav right? Well, look at the next verse in the same chapter, verse 16. The same person's talking, and he says, come near to me. Hear this, I've not spoken in secret from when? The beginning, from the time that it was, I was even there. And now the Lord God and his spirit has sent me. You have the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, all in one verse right here. Look at that. The Lord God, that's the Father, and his spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, has sent who? Me. Wow, this is the best verse to show about the, I use the word, triunity of God. Okay, look at John 18, 4 through 6. Yeshua, therefore, knowing all things that were coming upon him, went forth, and he said to them, Whom are you seeking? They answered him, We're seeking Yeshua of Nazareth. And Yeshua said unto them, I am he. And Judas also, who betrayed him, was standing with them, when therefore he said to them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. He is the all left top, right there. How much time do I have? Okay. Isn't this fascinating? Okay, so now what happens? Genesis 28, 20 through 22, Jacob takes an oath. And he said, if God be with me, and he keeps me safe on my journey, and he gives me food and clothing to put on so that I can come back to my father's house in peace, well, then I will take the Lord to be my God. And this stone which I put up for a pillar will be God's house. And of all you give me, I will give a tenth part to you. Isn't that interesting? I mean, it's a little narcissistic. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about me. You take care of me, God, and all. But what's fascinating, this is the exact place where God's house was built. And in Genesis 29, 5 and 6, he goes up to meet his new wife, Rachel. And he says to them, any of you know Laban, the son of Nahor? And who knows what Nahor means? How, how do you remember Nahor? Okay. Does anyone remember what Nahor means? Snorer. This is the first snorer in the Bible. I doubt if he had a CPAP machine, but he probably needed one. And um, they all said, well, yeah, we have. And he said to them, is he well? And they said, he is well. And look, his daughter Rachel's coming with the sheep. Oh, my gosh. And so uh, how many of you remember what Rachel's name means? It means a you, a lamb. She was a shepherdess and her name was basically lamb. Okay. In Genesis 29, 18 through 20, Jacob loved Rachel. And he said, I will serve you seven years for Rachel, your younger daughter. And Laban said, well, it's better I give her to you than I give her to someone else. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel. And they seemed to him but a few days for the love he had for her. And then... In Genesis 29, 22 through 23, Laban gathers together all the men of the place. He made a feast, and it came to pass in the evening that he took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to him, and he went unto her. You know what's fascinating? 
this is the first bachelor party <laughs> mentioned in the Bible even. Uh, okay. Genesis 29, 25 through 27. It says, in the morning, Jacob saw. It was Leah. And he said to Laban, what have you done to me? Ah, was I not working for you so that I might have Rachel? Why have you been false to me? And Laban said, well, in our country, we don't let the younger daughter be married before the older. Let the week of this bride feast. Here's where we see the wedding feast is a week long. Okay, which is why you have the week-long feast during the Feast of Tabernacles. Okay. And it says, uh, I will give you the other one also if you will be my servant for another seven years. So Jacob said, fine, and fulfilled her week. And he gave him, Rachel, his daughter to wife. Here we see, even before the Torah, in one sense, because there are no laws in Genesis, really. But we see in Genesis, before Moses was given the law of the Shemitah week, we see the week referred to seven years. Okay, in Genesis 29, 32 through 33, we see that Leah was with child. Who's doing that? And look at this. Leah gave birth to a son to whom she gave the name Reuben. And what does Reuben mean? Okay, what is Ben? And Ra'e is look or see. So she's going, look, a son. So she named him, look, a son. Reuben. And then uh, it says that she said, the Lord has seen my sorrow, and now my husband will have love for me. Then she became a child again and gave birth to another son and said, because it has come to the Lord's ears that I'm not loved, he's given me this son in addition, and she gave him the name Simeon. And what does Simeon mean to hear? Shema. And so she said, oh, the Lord hears, so I'm going to name him here. And then in Genesis 29, 34, and 35, she was with child again and gave birth to another son. And she said, now, at last, my husband will be united to me because I've given him three sons. So his name was Levi. And what do you think Levi means? The word united, to be joined. So all the kids, their names are mentioned in one sense in the Hebrew before we see they get the name. And so then it says, she was with child again, gave birth to a son, and she said, this time I will give praise to the Lord. So he was named Judah. After this, she had no more children for a time. Okay, so, and Judah means what? To praise. You see all that? All right. Now, Genesis 35 through 8. Okay, so she has, Leah has four kids. Well, now Rachel's upset. <clears throat> She can't have kids, so she gives Jacob Bilhah her handmaid. And she gave birth to a son, and Rachel said, God has been my judge and has given ear to my voice and given me a son, so he was named Dan. Notice that even though Bilhah gave birth, Rachel's the one who named the child. And she named him Dan, which means what? Judge. So you can see again why. And then it says, Rachel or Bilhah, Rachel's servant, was with child <clears throat> and gave birth to another son. And Rachel said, I have had a great fight with my sister and I've overcome her. And she gave this child the name Naphtali. And Naphtali basically means to wrestle. It was this great big fight. It was to wrestle. And then Genesis 30, 9 through 13, <clears throat> when it was clear to Leah that she would have no more children for a time, what does she do? She gives her handmaid Zilpah, her servant to Jacob as a wife, and Zilpah, Leah's servant, gave birth to a son. And Leah said, it has gone well for me. And she gave him the name of Gad. And Zilpah, Leah's servant, gave birth to another son. And Leah said, happy am I. And all women will give witness to my joy. And she gave him the name Asher. Happy, happy. Uh, and Gad can mean a troop or something along that line. And then Genesis 30, 18 and 19, Leah said, God has made payment to me for giving my servant girl to my husband. So she gave her the son the name Issachar. And again, Leah became a child. She gave Jacob a sixth son. And then Genesis 30, 20, 21, she said, God has given me a good bride price. Now, last will, I have my husband living with me. For I have given him six sons. And she gave him the name Zebulun. And after that, she had a daughter to whom she gave the name uh, Dina. 
And then in Genesis 30, 24, finally Rachel has a son and she gave him the name Joseph, meaning or saying, may the Lord give me another son. And Joseph's name basically means to add. Okay, so let me show you some verses here. When Isaac was 60 is when Jacob and Esau were born, and they were born in the year of Jubilee, and I have the Bible verse for every one of these. And then in the year 2123 from Adam, Isaac is 75, Abraham dies, Jacob and Esau are 15 years old. And then Isaac is 100 in the year 2148, and Esau marries a Canaanite at 40 years old. Isaac is 110, and that is when Shem dies. Jacob and Esau are 50 years old. And then when Isaac is 123, uh, that is when Ishmael dies. Jacob and Esau are 63 years old. And then Isaac is 137, and this is when he blesses Jacob and Esau. So Jacob and Esau are 77 years old after the whole incident of them fighting and giving away the birthright. And then we see Isaac is 143, which is in the year 2185 through 2191. This is when Jacob works set to seven years for Rachel. He gets Leah too, and he's 83 years old. Now I'm gonna go year by year. Okay, so Isaac is now 144 years old. Remember, Isaac thought he was gonna die clear back here. Okay, he's now 144. Jacob is 84 years old when Reuben is born. He's 85 when Simeon is born. He's 86. He's 86 years old when he's having babies. Okay, he's 87 when Judah and Dan are born. He's 88 when Naphtali's born. He's 89 when Gad is born. He's 90 when Asher is born and Issachar and Zebulun from another wife. Here we go the next seven years. Okay. Uh, here he is. He's 91 when Dina and Joseph are born. And then he has to work six years for the livestock and nobody's born. So he ends up being 97 years old when he's wrestling the angel. Isn't that nuts? Now, this kind of gives you an, another chart. He worked 20 years. The first seven years, he had no kids because he wasn't married to anybody. The next seven years, he had all the kids. And then the last six years, uh, he had to work for the livestock. There were no kids born. Now, I've got another little chart for you that's kind of fun. This shows you the age of all the kids when different events happened. Okay, so here's the, the mothers. Here's their kids. Here's how old they were the events happened. When they left Laban, okay, Joseph was six, and Reuben, the oldest, was only 13. And then, if you remember, they killed the Hivites. This is in Shechem. Remember the whole deal when they, you know, they had them all get circumcised, and then they go and kill them all? When they killed them all, Reuben, the oldest, was only 17. And his brothers were like 16, 15, 14. 13. No wonder all the residents were afraid of these kids. These teenagers were ruthless. Okay. Here's how old they were when they sold Joseph. The oldest was only 24. Joseph, we know, was 17 when he was sold. And then when they finally entered Egypt, this is the age of every single son when they entered Egypt. And then when Jacob was about to die, this is how old all the kids were at the time okay this is all math this is just following the torah you can see exactly how old they were at every single event okay so now genesis 31 19 laban had gone to see the cutting of the wool of his sheep and what did rachel do she secretly took the images of the gods of her father's house and then in Genesis 31, 41, Jacob comes and says, look, buddy, these 20 years I've been in your house. I was your servant for 14 years because of your daughters and six years I kept your flock and 10 times you changed my wages. And then in 32, one through four, all of a sudden, Jacob, 
90 some years old, comes face to face with the angels of God. And look at this. He, when he saw them, he said, this is the army of God. This is so heavy. This is so heavy, especially when it comes to the second half I'll be teaching. I love the fact that this Torah portion matches up with the second half. The angels are the army of God. We know in one sense on earth, the people of Israel are to be the army of God, but not only or is there the army of God to be on earth? There is an army of God in heaven. And he gave the place the name of Mahanaim, which means two armies, two camps, two armies. Now, Jacob sent servants before him to Esau, his brother in the land of Seir, the country of Edom, and he gave them orders to say these words to Esau. Your servant Jacob says, till now I have been living with Laban. Okay, we're going to take another look at this next week. Who was one of Esau's grandchildren? Who was one of Esau's grandkids? Who, what? Who was Esau's, one of Esau's grandkids? I told you last week, Esau is Edom. His grandson was Amalek. Esau, think how close Jacob and Esau are. They're brothers. And his grandson is Amalek. Right? Okay. Now, what's interesting, uh, who... Let me, how do I want to say this? Okay, well, let me, let me just think. Who were, who was Jacob's first grandchild? Who was Jacob's first grandchild? Okay, think about it. Who was the first one that it's mentioned to have kids? Judah. But remember, Judah married a Canaanite. And Judah had three Canaanite kids. Okay? Ur, Onan, and Shelah. And Ur and Onan were wicked, and God took them out. Okay? So then, let me rephrase it. Who was the first grandson from a Jewess of Judah? Who did... Who did Judah have relationships with that produced a grandson? Tamar. Exactly. But see, Tamar was his son's wife. And then what happened? These guys were wicked. She never had a kid. The next guy was wicked, never had a kid. She was waiting for Shelah, the younger one, to grow up. And the whole incident of Judah coming with Tamar. And they had, she had twins. And then it says he never had a relationship with her again when he found out who she was. Okay, <clears throat> and so she had twins. And who, uh, what was her twin's name? That will tell you the grandson. Okay, Jacob had Judah. Judah had relations with Tamar and had twins. So these would be the first grandkids that are mentioned in the Bible. Can you remember? Peretz and Zerah. <clears throat> Zerah means seed. And Poretz means the breaker. Now that's going to be very important to remember. Peretz and <clears throat> Zera. And it's going to be mind blowing. I think I'm going to touch that next week. But until then, let's stand. We'll take a break, come back, have a little bit of worship. And then we're going to jump into what is going to be one of the most mind blowing teachers teachings of the universe. All right, let's pray. Lord, our God, we just thank you so much that we can learn so much from your Torah. Your word is not dead. Your word is still alive. It's a breathing document. When we read 
Your Torah, we need to understand it's a breathing document. We need to feel your heartbeat. We want to know your character. We want to know you more. We want to know you to the core, to the very depth. We don't want to treat the Torah like just a book of history. We want to, this is a love letter to us from you. We want to devour it like we would any love letter, Father, and see what you are trying to tell us. What is your heartbeat? So, Father, I just thank you so much for all those that are here, all those around the United States, around the world, live streaming, that <clears throat> they also help us through tithes and offerings to take the light of your Torah all over the world. And it is so needed right now. We just thank you so much for all you're doing in each one of our lives. In Yeshua's name, amen. Together. Blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word by the power of your Holy Spirit through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua. You alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord our God. Amen. Take a break. I'm going to talk about a coming war between the United States and Iran that's going to happen next year. Okay? Iran is Amalek, and I believe there are signs in the heavens that are indicating to us this will happen beginning next spring. So, I want to show you this here in Exodus 17:16. Again, this is my starting verse. It says, because the Lord has sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. That means every generation there will be a war with Amalek, not just physical people, but the spirit of Amalek, like Hitler was the Amalek of his generation. But we also know that God said, you're to wipe out Amalek. There will come a time when Amalek will be no more, or the Amalek spirit, right? Well, I thought this was fascinating. This came from one of the generals during this current war right now. And it says, the Israel Defense Forces is operating against Hamas in the heart of Gaza City for the very first time in decades. And uh, the IDF Southern Command Chief Major General uh, Yaron Finkelman said on Tuesday, this generation is the generation of victory. I really believe this is the generation that will be the last generation to destroy Amalek. Prophetically, and because I believe the Messiah is coming, we'll have the thousand year reign of, reign of peace. We just finished a jubilee year, a generation, and I believe just as uh, the first generation had to wander in the wilderness before they could enter the promised land, the generation since Israel entered the promised land has gone by, and we are that generation that will have the victory over Amalek. Now let's look at Daniel chapter 10 and verse 1. It says, in the third year, Cyrus, king of Persia, where's, what's Persia today? Iran. A word was revealed to Daniel, and the word was true, and it was of a great warfare. Okay, we're talking of a great warfare. And Daniel gave heed to the word, and he understood the vision. Now, look at Daniel 10, 2, and 3. It says, let me see where I'm at here, in those Days, I, Daniel, was mourning how many weeks? Three whole weeks, and he fasted. He said he ate no pleasant bread, no flesh or wine came into my mouth, neither did I even anoint myself at all till the three whole weeks were fulfilled. And then in verse 4 and 5, it says, On the 24th day of the first month, I was by the side of the great river, which is Tigris, and I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a man clothed in linen whose loins were girded with the fine gold of Uphaz. Who does that sound like? The Messiah, Yeshua, standing there. Now, what month is the first month? 
Nisan. Okay, and what we're going to find, look at Daniel 10, 12 through 14. This messenger said to me, don't fear Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I am come because of your words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me how many days? 21 days, but lo, Michael, one of the kingdom's uh, uh, one of the chief princes came to help me and I was left over there beside the kings of Persia but now I'm going to make you understand what shall befall your people when this whole vision is for our time did you get that the vision wasn't for his time it was for us and here this angel has been fighting the prince of Persia for 21 days. So let's take a look here. All right, this is important. This is the year 2024. And I use that because this last Nissan, everything lined up perfectly per day as what's in the Torah. Nissan one is gonna have a new moon because it's Nissan one. We just found out the angel appeared on the 24th day of the first month, correct? Okay, well, it's fascinating that this year, well, we see the three weeks means he began his fast on the third of Nisan because third plus 21 is 24. See how math works? So that's when he began the fast. That's when he ended the fast. Well, guess what? This next year, on the 8th is a total solar eclipse that is beginning the month of Nisan. Sign from heaven, he created them for signs. This is the beginning of the religious year. Now here's Passover, this is gonna be Nisan 14, right? So what does that tell you? Daniel fasted all through Passover. Of course he couldn't keep it, he's in Babylon anyway. But it's fascinating that we understand the vision that he has that's everything's happening during the month of Nisan. So what happens? <clears throat> the, this year, we also have a comet that is coming on Passover that we'll be able to see. Again, comets have always been harbingers of things to come. So that's why 2024 is so important. But the angel wanted to meet Daniel there, but he couldn't because there's a war going on in heaven, right? And so here he is battling for 21 days, trying to get to Daniel to give him uh, the message. All right, Harry, I mean, man, this is a, a war that's going on in the heavenlies during the month of Nisan, all right? Finally, he appears and he tells them, guess what? I've been wanting to appear, you, appear to you from the very beginning, okay? And look at what this says. He says, um, let me see, Daniel 10, 20. It goes on and he said, do you know why I even came to you? <clears throat> and then he says, now I will return to fight with the prince of Persia. So he speaks to him and then off he goes back to the battle. Does everyone see that? Okay. Look at Isaiah 24, 19 and 20. The earth is utterly broken down. The earth is clean, dissolved. The earth is moving exceedingly. The earth is going to reel to and fro like a drunkard, will be removed like a cottage, and the transgression thereof will be heavy upon it, and it will fall and not rise again. And then look what it goes on to say. It'll come to pass in that day, what day is he talking about? The day of the Lord. <clears throat> that the Lord will punish the host of the high ones that are on high. Again, two battles going on. The Lord says, I'm going to punish all of those angelic hosts that are battling against the princes like Michael of Israel, right? Do you see a battle going on in the heavens here? I'm going to punish the high ones that are on high and the kings of the earth upon the earth. So there's two wars that are going on. One in the heavenly realm and one on the earthly realm. Does everyone see that plainly in this verse? 
Okay, and then it says they'll be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit. That's the millennial reign. And will be shut up in prison, and then after many days they'll be visited, and then the moon will be confounded, the sun ashamed, when the Lord of hosts will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before his ancients gloriously. That's what this is talking about. He comes, he's going to reign gloriously for a thousand years, and he's going to put everybody in the pit. Okay, now, let's go to First Chronicles 20, verse 1. It says, now in the spring, at the time when kings go to war, that Joab went out at the head of the armed forces, made waste of the land of the Ammonites, and put his men in position. When do the kings go to war? In the spring. As a matter of fact, it goes on to say in verse 4, now after this there was war with the Philistines. Verse 5, and again there was war with the Philistines, and again there was war at Gath. And so we see spring is the time of war. Remember, we're supposed to know the time and the seasons? The seasons doesn't refer to winter, spring, summer, fall. It refers that the spring is the tie, is the season for war. Not only on earth, but in the heavens, not only there, internally we have war going on inside. Well, we have to kill the flesh. Okay. Now, let me show you this here. Judges, chapter 5, verse 20. Where did they fight from? Heaven, the stars in their courses fought against Sisera. Remember, Israel's likened unto stars in Joseph's dream, okay? Now, here's the thing. There are two battles that are going on in heaven, and they take place in the spring. The entire vision that Daniel had was in the month of Nisan. When does this vision of warfare take place in the end of days? During the month of Nisan, which is when Passover is. I believe this will be the final war with Amalek or Iran. So think about this. Daniel's vision of the last days was of a war going on during the month of Nisan. That is spring, and it was meant for us, okay? When was the first time Amalek attacked Israel? It was in the second month, Iyar. This was at the Exodus, okay? Which was like uh, April going through May is the month of Iyar. The second time he attacked was about a thousand years later in the 12th month, which is Adar, which has to do with Esther. And Adar is like March or April. We see in this vision, that the third and final attack to wipe out Amalek is going to be in the first month, Nisan. Now, Nisan bounces around. It could be, uh, you know, the end of March, April, the beginning of May, something along that line. But it is in the spring, the Bible tells us, when the kings go to war. So just like uh, Am- uh, Haman was casting lots to see when to attack, we see the first attack came in Iyar, which is the second month around our May. And then the second attack came in the month of Adar, which is the 12th month, okay, which is like our March. And this final attack of Amalek, he casts lots, trying to decide, do I attack them in the second month? Do I attack them in the 12th month? He's throwing dice and says, let's, time, let's try Nisan. And so that final battle I see happening next year around April. Let's look at Numbers 24, 14. Here, Balaam is speaking to Balak, king of the Moabites. And look what he says in Numbers 24, 14. Balaam says, okay, I'm going back to my people. Come and I will let you know what the Jews will do to you when? In the latter days. What do we know about the Moabites and the Ammonites? They're both from who? Lot, and they both worshipped Molech. Now look at Numbers 24, 17 through 20. It says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but it's not near. There will come a star out of Jacob, a scepter out of Israel, and will smite the corners of Moab and destroy all the children of Seth. And Adam, that's Esau, 
will be a possession. Say, Ir will be a possession for his enemies, and Israel will do valiantly. Out of Jacob shall come he that will have dominion. He will utterly destroy those that are remaining in the city. And when, look at this, and Balaam is saying, when he looked on who? Amalek. He took up this parable and said, Amalek was the first of the nations basically to attack Israel, but his latter end will be that he what? That is a prophecy that hasn't been fulfilled. We see right now Amalek attacking Israel, and I think it's so vicious and violent because it's the last time. This is his last shot. Now, look at Psalm 83, 6 through 8, which is one of the key verses at the beginning of this series. The tabernacles of Edom, who is Esau, the Ishmaelites of Moab, the Hagarines, Gebal, and look at this, the Ammonites, Moab and Ammonites are brothers, and who else? Amalek, who else? The Philistines, that's Gaza Strip, with the inhabitants of these other places to help the children of Lot. And we know the children of Lot worshipped Molech. Now, look at Joel 3.19. Egypt will be a desolation. Edom will be a desolate wilderness because of the violence against the children of Judah. And what's the Hebrew word for violence? Hamas. This is talking about today, the violence of Hamas because they shed innocent blood in their land. Just like they, wa- they worship Molech. They're always shedding innocent blood. The Moabites and the Ammonites. And what did they do? Hamas took the babies. They took the children. They took the uh, elderly. This is basically what Amalek did at the very beginning. It says, but Judah's going to dwell forever in Jerusalem from generation to generation. Now look at Ezekiel 7, 5 through 8. Thus saith the Lord, an evil, an only evil, behold, it's come. But guess what else? Its end is come. The end is come. It watches for you. Behold, it is come. The morning's come to you. O you that dwell in the land, the time is come. The day of trouble is near. What is that talking about? The day of trouble, the day of the Lord, the tribulation. And not the sounding again of the mountains, Now, God says, will I shortly pour out my fury upon you? I will accomplish my anger upon you, and I will judge you according to your ways and will recompense you for all of your abominations. Now, look what the next verses say in the very same book and chapter. Behold the day. Behold, it has come. The morning has gone forth. The rod has blossomed. Pride has budded. Hamas has risen up. The violence, Hamas has risen up into a rod of wickedness. None of them are going to remain, nor of their multitude, nor any of theirs, neither shall there be wailing for them. God is about to wipe Hamas off the face of the earth forever. Yes. Okay, now let me show you how this works. I'm going to put up this little chart. Now look at this. This is May of last year, 2023, and I'm going to prove to you how everything is lining up this year biblically. Okay, ER, the second month, is the month of war. It is spring. And we're going to find in Exodus 16 and 17, it's the second month. One month has passed since they left Egypt. This is going back to the very first Passover. They've left Egypt. They've been gone for a month. And look at this. It's going to talk about how they entered the wilderness of sin. And it is the 15th day of ER. The 15th day of the second month. So let's look at Exodus 16.1. They took their journey from Elim. All the congregation of the children of Israel came unto the wilderness of sin, which is between Elim and Sinai on what day? 15th day of the second month. How do I know that it was a Shabbat? It's very easy. Watch what the Bible says. Okay, verse 2, what happens? 
the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and in the wilderness. What are they doing? Here they are. Well, first off, the 15th of the second month, they were to keep the second Passover. Do you remember? So here they are. It's on a Shabbat. They're doing the second Passover, and they start complaining. We want food to eat. We want food. Okay? And so God says, give them some quail. So boom, she gets to eat quail. And then watch what happens here. Verse 8, Moses said, this will be when the Lord will give you, the Lord is going to give you tonight in the evening flesh to eat. And in the morning, bread to the full. For the Lord hears your murmurings, but your murmuring actually against him. And what are we? Your murmurings aren't against us, but against the Lord. And then verse 12 and 13, I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel. Tell them at even you will eat flesh. And in the morning, you're going to be filled with manna. And you'll know that I'm the Lord your God. And it came to pass, at even the quails came up and covered the camp. And in the morning, the dew lay around the host. Okay. So what that says is on Shabbat, they got the quail, and in the morning, they got the manna. And they had the manna for how many days? Six days. And the double portion came on the sixth day, and the next day was Shabbat. That's how we know the 15th day was a Shabbat. Does it make sense? That's how it went. Okay? Then we find in Exodus 17, they go to a place called Rephidim. Now look at this. Exodus uh, 16, 25, and 26, Moses says, eat that today, for today's the Sabbath to the Lord. Today you're not going to find it in the field. Six days you gather it. Seventh day, which is the Sabbath, there isn't going to be any. So now we get to Exodus 17, 3, and there, they're whining again. And this time, they want water. And they said, why have you brought us out of Egypt just to kill us and our cattle and our kids with thirst? And then verse 6, God says, behold, I'm going to stand before you on a rock in Oreb, and you will smite the rock, and the water will come out that the people can drink. And so Moses did so in the sight of Israel. So they're whining for food. God gives them quail. A week later, they get the manna all week. Now they're whining for water. God gives them water. But what happens then? Amalek. Whining and complaining always brings an Amalek experience. Now, you see, Shavuot is the following week. Also, the devils don't want you to experience Shavuot and the giving of the Torah. He does everything he can. You've already conquered him by leaving Egypt. But now what he wants to do, he doesn't want you to get re-energized at Shavuot. And so he's doing everything he can in the second month so you don't get the spirit in the third month. Does that make sense? Okay. So, but do you know, being a month of war, this is the very day the war in 1948 began. That's a month of war. Guess what? This is the very day in 67, the Six Day War happened. I'm trying to show you, E-Yar is the month of what? War, war, and then comes Amalek, and that's what happened in 48, that's what happened in 67. When these things happen, that is the time of war. Okay, everyone see that? Okay, now, a year later goes by. Now we are back in ER, which is the second month, but we're in the second year, and we're in Numbers 10 through 12. It's still ER, all right, which is... A time for war. Here we go. Let's watch what happens. We know the 15th again is the time they could keep the Passover in the second month. And we're going to find Numbers 10. It's the second month of the second year. And they go on a three-day journey. Think about this. They've had a year vacation. A year vacation. And now God says, okay, let's get up. It's time to go to war. You've had your rest. We're going to just go on a three-day journey. And what happens after just three days? They whine again. Same month, same time. And let's watch what happens. Look at your notes, Numbers 10, 11 through 14. In the 
second year, in the second month, on the 20th day of the month, the cloud lifted up. The people of Israel set out by stages. Remember how they marched east, south, west, north. That's the order of how they marched. And they marched, they set out for the first time at the command of who? The Lord, by Moses. The standard of the camp of the people of Judah went out first, okay? And over their company was Nakshon. Why was Nakshon the first one to lead all of Israel? Does anyone remember? Nakshon is the first one to jump into the Red Sea, and it wasn't until he jumped in that the water parted when they were leaving Egypt. Someone moved out in faith. Now look at Numbers 11, one, here's what happened. The people are complaining. And when the people complained, it displeased the Lord and the Lord heard it. His anger was kindled and the fire of the Lord burnt among them, consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. And the people cried unto Moses and Moses prayed to the Lord and the fire was quenched. So here we go. They whined, the fire came and consumed them all. So here we go. That was the very day Israel became a nation. The very same day Israel became a nation, the 23rd of Eyar is the very same day that the fire of God falls and consumes them because they're whining and complaining. And that's the day Israel becomes a nation again. So here we go. Now, here we are, it's still the second month because their calendar is different than our calendar. Here's Shavuot, the sixth of Savan, but it's still ER all that week up in there. And what does it say happens in Numbers 11, 4? The mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting, and the children of Israel wept again. And they said, who's going to give us flesh to eat? What happened the last time when they did that the year before? What did God give them? Quail. And now they're whining for quail again at the same time they did the previous year. Do you see how this is a season of whining and complaining, which is why it's also the season of battles? So let's watch what happens. Here they are. They're whining. Ooh, we want flesh to eat. So God sends them quail. Here you go. But look what happens. God says in 11, 19, and 20, you're not going to eat just one day or two days, nor five days or 10 days or 20 days, but a whole stinking month until it comes out of your nose. And it's loathsome unto you because you've despised the Lord, which is among you. You've wept before him saying, why did we come out of Egypt? And so numbers 11, 30, one, there went forth a wind from the Lord and brought quail from the sea and let them fall by the camp as it were a day's journey on this side and as it were a day's journey on the other side round the camp and as it were two cubits high upon the face of the earth. Let me put that in perspective. That means the quail were three foot high for 40 miles. That's how much quail fell. A cubit is 18 inches, so two cubit would be 36 inches or three feet. A day's journey is about 20 miles times two. It's a day's journey on that side and a day's journey on that side. They had three foot of quail for 40 miles. Okay? But look at what happens next. Numbers 11:33. While the flesh was still between their teeth, air was even chewed. The wrath of the Lord was kindled against the people, and the Lord smote the plague, the people, with a very great plague. So... The day they're whining, they get the quail, but here comes the plague. Boom! And guess what? That's the very same day of the six-day war. You following me? And they get quail for a whole month. And what happens the very next day after the plague? Miriam murmurs. ER is the second month. We're supposed to know the times and seasons. Well, I'll tell you the season. ER is a month of whiny, whinies, complainers, and great spiritual battles and physical battles. I hope I prove that. 
Does everyone see that? This is why much of Christianity is so at loss. You ask them if you're supposed to know the times and seasons, they go, yes. And you ask, okay, what is the season of ER? I never even heard of ER, let alone what happens during ER. But this is why I'm going to write uh, an article on every Hebrew month and what happens that month. Just like this. And so you'll be able to see what the season is you're in and what the battle is you need to face. Does that make sense? Be fun, huh? Okay. Numbers 12.1. Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses. So here she is complaining. All right, now we're going to jump to Numbers 13.29. The, Amalek, the Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. The Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. Now, look at this. Genesis 36, 12. Timnah was concubine to Eliphaz, Esau's son, and she bare to Eliphaz who? Okay, let's take a look here. Here we go. I'm going to give you all the begats here in a nice little chart. Here is Esau. He's 40 years old when he marries Basimath in Genesis 26, 34, and Judith. Okay, Esau. Judith is the daughter of a Hittite, and Basimath is a daughter of Elon, another Hittite. So he marries two Hittites. And if you remember, Isaac and Rebekah were so upset that he married these two Hittites. After the blessing, when Jacob leaves the promised land, he goes, well, gee, my mom and dad don't like it. So I'm going to go marry one of Ishmael's daughters. So he marries one of Ishmael's daughters. He's the sister of Nebaioth in Genesis 28, 9. So now watch how this unfolds. That's his first three wives. But then he could care less about what mom and dad thinks. And so he goes back and he marries the sister of Basimath, Ada, who also is the Elon's the same father. And then he goes over and marries a Hivite called Oholibama. Genesis 36, 2. Okay, then what happens? That's not enough. He needs another wife. So he marries another lady named Basimath, who is one of the daughters of Ishmael. Okay, so now he starts having kids. Esau and the Basimath of Ishmael's daughter has a kid named Ruel. And then Ada and Esau's relationship produces Eliphaz. And Esau and Oholibama produces Jeus. Uh, Jalam and Korah, all right? Then we find out he has grandkids from Ruel and Aliphaz. But if you remember, Jacob comes back. That was going to be next week's Torah portion. He's been gone. He comes back. And what happens? Genesis 33, 16, Esau, turning back that day, went on his way to Seir because he went into the land of Seir away from his brother Jacob. Do you remember when all of a sudden Jacob comes back and he says, there's not enough room for all of us, you know, whatever. And he goes and he goes over there. A matter of fact, the whole family of Esau packs up and moves to say ear. Okay. Now look at Genesis 14, five through seven. Well, before we do that, look at the chart, look at the chart. Here's what happens. Here is Seir. That's a whole other people group. And Seir has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven sons and a daughter. Timna is the sister to Lotan. He probably had other wives, okay, for all these kids. But Lotan, he has a couple kids, but his sister is Timna. And what happens? They all move to where? Seir. Okay, now, Seir was a Horite, okay? He was a Horite. Now, it says in Genesis 14, 5 through 7, and in the 14th year, Herodolaomer, that is the king of Babylon, and the kings who were with him 
overcame the Rephaim in Ashtaroth, Karnaim, and the Zuzim in Ham, and the Amim in Shaveh, Kiriathim, and the Horites in their mountain, Seir, driving them as far as El Paran, which is near the wasteland, and then they came back to En Mishpat, which is Kadesh, and making waste all the country of who? The Amalekites. Okay, so here we go. They move from Canaan. They have to leave because Jacob is back, and they all go there. And so what happens? What happens? Now, look at this. Eliphaz, who is Eliphaz? He's half Hittite, and he's half Edomite. Does everyone see that? Right? Well, when they move, he decides that, uh, hey, he wants to have a concubine. So he has Timna be his concubine, and they have a kid whose name that is where Amal Amalek comes from. So what do we know about Amalek? He's a quarter Edomite. He's a quarter Hittite, and he's half Horite. So if you want to know who Amalek is, I just told you. He's not just all Edomite. Yes, it's Esau's grandson, but he's a quarter Edomite, a quarter Hittite, and he's half Horite. Does everyone see that? Now we understand Amalek. But look how Esau treated his relatives. He killed them all. He wiped them out, it says. Did you catch that? Look at that. Again, Genesis 14, 5 through 7. The 14th year of Kerdor Laomer, the kings who were on his side, overcame the Rephaim in Ashtoreth, Karnaim, and the Zuzim in Ham, and the Amim in this other place, and the Horites in their mountains, Seir, driving them as far away near the wasteland. They came back then, making waste all the country of the Amalekites. And, and so what did they do? They're making waste of them, forcing them out of their own land. So they move in and kick them out. Kind of like what happens in Gaza. Now, let's look at Deuteronomy 2, 12. It says, and the Horites in earlier times were living in Seir, because Seir was a Horite, but the children of Esau took their place. They sent destruction on them and took their land for themselves. Wow, look how they treat family. Okay, so look at uh, here. Here we have Mount Seir. Seir is right here in Jordan. You see that? It's, it's close to Petra. It's right up here. Here's Israel. Down here is the Gulf of Aqaba a lot. Uh, so we were going to go by right through this. Uh, but anyway, I wanted to see where Mount Seir is. And that is where Amalek was born. He ended up going to the area of the Philistines. But now Babylon conquers them. And he ends up getting hauled off over to Iran, which is where the whole story of Esther took place, at Shushan the palace. And Haman is Amalek. Okay, now, look at Isaiah 60, verse 1 and 2. Arise and shine, for your light has come. The glory of the Lord has risen on you. For behold, the darkness will cover the earth. Gross darkness to people, but the Lord is going to rise on you, and his glory will be seen on you. This is not just darkness, black, but moral darkness. And then look at Isaiah, the next verses, 60, 18, and 19. What? Violence or Hamas will no more be heard in your land. Wahoo! Okay? Wasting nor destruction will be within your borders, but your walls will be called Yeshua. Salvation. Okay? And your gates praise. The sun will no more be your light, neither for brightness shall the moon give light, but the Lord himself will be unto you your light and God for your glory. This is where we're coming from. Okay, now, Luke 21, 25 says, there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, in the stars, and upon the earth, the stress of nations. So here we go. 
Are you ready? <sighs> Solar eclipses. Genesis 1.14. That's what it says. Are for signs. Let me prove this to you now. How many total solar eclipses have been over the United States since we, since we became a nation in 1776? Okay? Only total. How many total solar eclipses have been over the United States since we became a nation in 1776? Are you ready? Eight. That's it. I will tell you when they were. In the 1700s, that's when they were. And then, 80 years later, in the 1800s, that's when they were. And then 92 years later, in the 1900s, we only had two. Okay? And then, 38 years later, we have the eighth one. And what was the eighth one? Drum roll, August 21st, 2017, the great American eclipse that happened. How many of you remember that? Why? Guess what? This is the very first, the very first total solar eclipse that was exclusive to the United States since before the nation's founding in 1776. In other words, there's been solar eclipses, but they went through Mexico in the United States. They went through Canada in the United States. This one here is the very first one ever that happened seven, one Shemitah year cycle, okay? And guess what? Solar eclipses speak of judgment on a nation. Lunar eclipses speak of judgment on Israel. This very first solar eclipse means specifically judgment upon the United States is coming. You following me? Let's see what may be coming. April 8th, 2024, the one that's coming next year is the ninth eclipse. And nine, because it's the last of the digits, always means the fine finality, judgment. Okay, so let's take a look at these again. Look at the top right, the 1700s. Now, just remember, April 8th is Nisan 1. So it's targeting God's biblical calendar. Guess what happened during those first two eclipses in the 1700s? The Revolutionary War. What happened in 1860s? The Civil War. What happened in the 1970s? The Vietnam War. Okay? Then we have this warning of August 21st, 2017, warning about next year. I think there's a real good chance we're going to see a major war taking place next spring here in the United States. The next solar eclipse doesn't even occur until 2044. All right, so when we understand, like I said, Luke 21, there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and the stars, on earth, distress of nations with perplexity. Now, when do solar eclipses occur over the next several years? Here's Nisan 1, April 8th, 2024. Guess what? The very next one is on Rosh Hashanah. And then the next one again is on Nisan 1. And the next one again is on Rosh Hashanah. Is God trying to say something? Nisan goes to the month of Judah on the east at sunrise. The next one on the west, which is sunset. And then back to Judah. It goes from Judah to Ephraim. Judah to Ephraim. Judah's on the east. Ephraim's on the west. Okay. And who Judah's mother is Leah. Then it goes to Rachel. Then it goes to Leah. Then it goes to Rachel. Okay? So here they are again. Now, it's happening during Passover. The three days of darkness happens. But Nisan 1 is a total solar eclipse. Tishri 1 is an annular. Nisan 1 is a partial solar and then a partial. All happening on these dates. Where? Mexico, America, Canada. The Pacific, Chile, and Argentina. Africa, Europe, Russia. The South Pacific, New Zealand, Antarctica, they're covering everywhere. Now we come to the lunar eclipses. What do we have? These are the dates. These are where they're going to be seen. Okay, September 18th is a low 15. That is the month before Tishri, which is all about we need to repent. Then on March, that's a dar 14, 
that's Purim. That's when Amalek is defeated. Okay, Persia represents Iran, Gaza. Okay, that's where Haman lives. He is Amalek. Elo 15. So it goes from the time month of repentance to the month of Amalek. Back again to the month of repentance. Back again to Adar 14 where Amalek is defeated. Or Iran, Gaza. Okay, so let's take a look. What do we have? A partial lunar eclipse, a total lunar eclipse, a total lunar eclipse, a total lunar eclipse. Oh my gosh, I told you last week, NASA says a total lunar eclipse only happens once every year and a half. Here we have three in one and a half years and they all fall on the biblical holy days, holidays. Okay, so here's when they fall. And guess what? It was east to west. Now it's south, uh, Gad, to Naphtali in the north, back to Gad, back to Naphtali. So what do we have? Zilpah, passing it off to Bilhah. Zilpah, back to Bilhah. All right? So here is the summary of all of the eclipses in order, both solar and lunar. And what do we see? Judah. Passes it to Gad. Who passes it to Ephraim? Who passes it to Naphtali? Back to Judah. Back to Gad. Back to Ephraim. Back to Naphtali. This is the exact order of how they journeyed to Numbers 10 before they went to war. And they marched, it says, by their flags. Look at Numbers 10, 35 and 36. It came to pass when the ark went forward. Oh, that's coming up. Okay, let's look at this. Okay, remember, it went from Judah all the way through Leah's kids to Gad. Then it went from Ephraim to Naphtali. That is how the baton was passed, okay? That's how they were set. And it's according to the months. They went to war in the order of their courses and how they marched. They went from Judah to Gad to Ephraim to Naphtali, and that is the same order of all of these eclipses. Here we have April 8th, Nisau 1, the days of darkness took place. In, we have Passover, and we have this comet coming on Passover. Then here, the next total lunar eclipse, Elo 15, time of repentance. Up to Tishri 1, Ephraim, over to Naphtali, Amalek, back to Judah. March 29th, Nisau 1, back to Gad. Okay, total solar eclipse, back to Ephraim, total total, uh, solar eclipse, back over to Naphtali. These eclipses are exactly coinciding with the month of how they went to war in Numbers 10. Now look at Numbers 10, 35 and 36. It says, it came to pass when the ark went forward that Moses said, rise up, O Lord, let your enemies be scattered and let them that hate you flee before you when it rested. He said, return, O Lord, to the many thousands of Israel. Look at this. Here's that verse. When the ark set out, Moses said what? Rise up, O Lord, may your enemies be scattered, may your flows flee before you. Whenever it came to rest, he said, return, O Lord, to the countless thousands of Israel. Let me show you something that is in every Torah scroll that is not in your English Bibles. These are bracketed by two upside down backward letter noon. And noon means fish. Now, there is the ancient letter noon, meaning fish darting through water. Here is the modern letter noon. Okay, so it represents fish. Here is a Torah scroll showing you the two upside down letter noons in every Torah scroll that you don't get in your English Bibles. So it's like two dead fish surround this passage. And the sages have always wondered, what in the world does that mean? Well, the word fish means something that's alive and jumping. So if we go to the beach, this one's alive and this one's dead. You get it? Okay, so here we are. We have the scroll. And it says, rise up, O Lord, and return, O Lord. And it's got these dead fish. Well, watch this dead fish on the left It says, rise up, O Lord. Here we go. He rises. That speaks of the resurrection of the Messiah. And then the second dead fish, return, O Lord, is when he returns and we rise up. 
All of that is sitting in that, when the armies go to war, it returns to the, it refers to, that's why the Christian is the fist symbol. Okay? Now, here is, Moses wrote the letter Aleph like an ox. David wrote the letter like this, and that's the modern. Just like you have different fonts on your computer over history, there's been different things. Okay? Aleph, uh, aloof means ox. Now, here is the pattern of eclipses coming across the United States. It looks just like the letter Aleph that David wrote. The first one, the 21st of 2017 went that way. We had one just recently, October, that goes this way. Now the one April 8th is going to cut across, okay, on April 8th, which is Nisan 1. Here, October 7th, we had Hamas attacking Israel, which is exactly seven days before the eclipse of October 14th. Again, telling us this is referring to war. Boom, there goes that eclipse. Right here is where it intersects the other two eclipses that came. What do we know about that intersection? Like I said, San Antonio. And guess what? San Antonio, here, every red heart is a zip code just in San Antonio, Texas, where children are being sex trafficked. That's human trafficking. And that, what do you think God wants to help the women, the children? And this is one of the number one places that sex trafficking takes place. And look what Hamas did to the women and the children during this attack. As it was in the days of Noah and Lot, Lot was filled, the Noah's day, it was filled with what? Which is Hamas. Okay, and we know Ham, uh, but when they say violence, literally in the Hebrew, it refers to sexual violence. It refers to kidnapping, murder, and theft, which is exactly what Hamas did when they attacked Israel. All of those things. And then, of course, Ham, the son of Noah, comes from Hamas violence. <clears throat> that one far leg where it crosses is in a place in Illinois named Little Egypt. Isn't that amazing? Here, you can see in Little Egypt, they have Cairo, Thebes, Karnak. There's even a Goshen. This whole area is known as Little Egypt. Okay? Right there, Goshen Way, Cairo, Thebes. There's even an Egyptian mental health department there. And some residents of Little Egypt still own slaves. Illinois law gave a special exemption to the Saltwater Works near Equality, which is right there. This is from Southern Illinois. They allowed slaves. Right there. Southeastern Illinois College. <sighs> Remember that? That's Horus, the god of Egypt. Well, guess what? That is their logo. With an Egyptian pyramid. As a matter of fact, let me bring this out. In 1960, when Southeastern Illinois College was formed, a sphinx was included in the official seal of the college to honor Little Egypt heritage, shared by the people of the college district. A few years later, they also incorporated another Egyptian symbol, the pyramid. The competitive teams have always had the falcon uh, as their mascot. And in Egypt, the king was thought of as a living god. While he was alive, he was horse, the falcon-headed sky god, sitting on the magic Isis throne. When he died, he became Osiris, the god of the underworld and his heir became Horus. Here, this eclipse here is cutting through the heart of sex trafficking and children. Here is little Egypt. And this eclipse is happening on the very same day the three days of darkness took place in little Egypt or in the main Egypt during the main exodus. Same time frame, same place. I believe America is going to be a target this next year. We need to be ready, uh, but the, the problem is we're not really looking where we're supposed to be looking. God tells us we're to look up, not down. <clears throat> and so it's time to wake up. But the church says, give me a few more minutes of sleep. Instead of looking up, where are we looking? Luke 21, 28, when you see these things come to pass, look up, lift your head, your redemption draws an eye. Now, if this impacted you, please email, friend, Facebook, tell people they need to watch this because I'm telling you right now, I really believe war is going to be coming to America this next spring. Amen? Sorry I went a little bit longer.
But let's stand and pray.